All right, this morning, kind of had a, a, a long title. I don't know if it's had an overhead for that or not, but it was called, in fact, I was talking to Becky, and she said, well, that's a pretty long title, but it's called uh, Repurposing OT Scriptures in the Gospel. And the OT is, is not overtime, it's Old Testament. Uh, I've found recently that I know some of you people may uh, be familiar with uh, Andy Stanley. He was a he's a, a Baptist pastor. I don't know whether it's in Georgia has a mega church there, but recently has said he's he was going to stop uh, teaching at all out of the uh, Old Testament. And I don't know why he made that decision or if that was a reaction to something. But there's so much in the Old Testament. That, that is layered and is repeated in the New Testament. And when I use the word uh, repurposing, in other words, actually taking something that was meant to say something which you could actually say is out of context and put it in the New Testament with a different meaning. And yet the Lord does that. And there's a lot of parallels also between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so what I'm going to do is we're gonna, uh, mainly going to, I'm going to go through some scriptures in, in Matthew, just to give you several examples. Most of them I probably won't read. I'll give you the address where they're at, so if you want to find them later, you can go look. But we're going to spend most of our time, as we get past Matthew, we're going to go into John, and spend most of our time in, in Gospel of John, chapter 9 and chapter 10. Uh, the teaching in Matthew is that, you know, Matthew is, of the four Gospels, it's the one that is really presented to a Jewish audience, okay? It's kind of like Hebrews and the epistles and also James are the other two books that are primarily focused upon Jews, while the others are, are both Jew and Gentile. And so... Uh, so as Matthew begins to, that's why you have all, you know, at the beginning of Matthew, you have the long uh, genealogy, uh, which would make, would be important to the Jewish believer. But, so I'm going to go through these scriptures in Matthew, and like I say, we're going to spend most of our time actually in John, and then we're going to, at the end, we're going to have ministry time, but the ministry time is going to have nothing at all to do with what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so the two almost kind of separate things here. So I'm going to start, actually, uh, a place where you can find this is in Exodus chapter 4. Don't turn there, but in verse 23, uh, the Lord calls Israel my firstborn son. And, of course, we know that Jesus is the Son of God, Call that. Where in Matthew chapter 2, I do want to read... Uh, Verse 13 through 15, kind of give you a, a look at what we're kind of talking about with repurposing. Now, in chapter 2, this is the uh, escape. And it says, verse 13, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up and he took the child and his mother and during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Okay, so he repeats this, this prophecy, out of, out of Egypt I call my son. And that's actually taken out of Hosea 11.1. 1. And I'm just going to turn there real quickly and read that to you, just because I think you're going to see what I'm talking about. Hosea 11.1 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. Okay, that whole passage, as you go through the whole thing, is talking about the nation of Israel. 
It's not talking about the Son of God. So it'd be easy for me to say, if you were saying, reading that scripture out of Matthew, I could go, well, you're, you're taking that completely out of context because that was talking about the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt. And we would both be right because, yes, it was. That was what the original meaning was, but how God repurposed and uses a, a part of scripture and puts a whole different meaning on it and uses it in the New Testament. So, and we, you'll find that all the way through. Uh, and we're used to that kind of in, uh, in the epistles, especially of Paul's writing, because, you know, we see many times he'll repurpose an Old Testament text and, and bring it up to talking about something that's happening now, a new fulfillment or, or parallel to it. And all of you guys know that probably one of the most famous verses, probably the first verse you learn is, is John 3.16, right? Well, a lot of times we don't pay attention to the two verses right before that. So in, uh, let's see, John, I'm going to look at 14. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you do come to me. And Jesus replied, let it be now, done now, as is proper to us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John conceded. conceded. And Jesus was baptized. He went out of the water, and the moment was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and, and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So, so Jesus comes at this point basically from total obscurity. If you think about it, the only thing we have to know about Jesus besides his birth is that about when he's just 12 years old, he goes to the goes to the temple, and his parents are looking for him, you know, and he's lost, and they don't know where he's at, and he comes back, and they, uh, they, you know, they're kind of upset because they didn't tell him where he was, and he was, you know, talking with all the scribes and Pharisees. But outside of that, we have nothing else in the New Testament that talks about what happened between then and the time he turns 30 years old. And all of a sudden, he comes at the age of 30, and he shows up on the scene. And it's the same way with, with Moses. If you think about Moses, Moses was, was 40 years old when he was told, you know, he thought, you know, he was 40 years old, and he was a son of, uh, you know, how he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. And he thought that the Israelites would know that he was sent to deliver them. Well, he ends up killing the Egyptian, and then he has to flee. And he's 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years going around, leading sheep. And so that vision he had, that, that, um, that vision, that, that hope, that ministry that he thought he had was completely dead. So, he, so now he turns out to be 80 years old before the Lord all sudden appears in the burning bush and calls him in to this ministry. And he had not even uh, circumcised his sons. So, which was a very important part of the Abrahamic covenant. So that, that vision, that, that thing was completely dead. It's called, you know, the death of a vision. It was completely dead. Now, another one is in, in chapter 2, verses uh, 2, 13 through 15, which is, well, I did that where he came out of Egypt. And how, let me read that to you. He said, he said, out of Egypt I called my son. That's verse uh, chapter 2 and verse 13. And again, how that was actually talking about Israel coming out. But there was a repurposing of that whole thing. Now, also in that chapter, uh, Matthew 2, and verse 13 through 15, we find that uh, 
after he says to Joseph to go flee, and out of Egypt he comes. And then right after that, it says that when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So you find this same story happening in, uh, well, that's Matthew chapter 2, 16, but also in Exodus chapter 2, 16, Pharaoh did the same thing. He tried to kill all the Israelites males. So that was the time when Moses, they had to hide Moses and put him in the, you know, in the Nile River, tried to escape because the, he, the Pharaoh told all the uh, midwives that any female that was born, they would let live, but any male they would kill. So you have this parallel of happen, what happened in Moses' day and then what happened in, in uh, Jesus' time. Because after Herod had asked the Magi who were going to worship Jesus, he told them when they come back, come back to me and tell him where he is so I can go worship him. Well, he wasn't going to go worship him. He was planning on killing him. And so after a time of almost two years, Herod, real, Herod realizes they're not coming back. And that, so he goes and he actually kills all the males two years and younger. And so you have this same parallel working again through Scripture. Now, some other ones are that, um, you know, you think of that, the temptation of Jesus. You know, he was 40 years in the world, or 40 days and nights fasting, and Moses was 40 days uh, and nights also fasting. Israel was tempted for 40 days, for 40 years in the wilderness. In fact, they can continue to complain and, and complain about the food, complain they didn't have water, whatever, always complaining. And they had judgment come upon them. While Jesus overcame the temptation by the word of the Lord. And so he was successful in that. Now, Matthew chapter 5 through 8, we have what's called the Sermon on the Mount, which corresponds to the law being given by Moses from Sinai. We have Jesus feeding the 5,000 and then the 4,000. And Moses, it actually wasn't Moses, but the Lord that provided Israel with manna for 40 years in the wilderness. And another big one is the transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17. And on that story, it's where Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John. They go up to this high mountain, which we believe is, is Mount Hermon. But also corresponds to Exodus 24, where Moses took Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu up with him. But Jesus is transformed before them. They go up this high mountain, and all of a sudden he's, he's transformed, and his face and his clothes are just glowing with, you know, with glory. And, um, and then Peter you know, says, you know, should I make three temples? Because also Moses and Elijah show up with him. And they're talking to him about his departure. And then a cloud comes over. And this voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Where well, in Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses prophesies that very thing. He says, after me, there's going to become a prophet that's going to be raised up. And he says, after I come, listen to him. And then that is fulfilled right on the Mount of Transfiguration. And also, if you remember from the Old Testament, that Moses, after he came down from the mountain, his face was shining. In fact, he had to start wearing a, a veil over his face because of, of the glory that was shining from his face. So you have all these different parallels going on. And, of course, Passover would be the time where uh, the new covenant is instituted and Passover is fulfilled as Jesus becomes the Lamb of God. And he is sacrificed for men. Another one was where uh, 
where Jesus tells them that, that I'm going to be lifted up just as Moses lifted up the serpent on a pole. And what happened back then was that, as usual, the Israelites were complaining and coming against Moses and coming against the Lord. And it says the Lord sent uh, fiery servants serpents upon them and they were biting them and they were dying and so Moses intercedes and he prays for them and the Lord tells him to make a a bronze serpent and put it on a big pole set it out whoever looks upon that serpent who's been bitten would be healed and so they did that and it stopped this plague of, of snakes that were killing people and then Jesus says just like Moses was lifted up I'm going to be lifted up of course, his is going to be on a cross. But whoever looks upon him, believes upon him, will be saved. So you have all these different parallels going on. And, and again, Scripture that could be taken would be considered, if you were just looking from the New Testament time, Old Testament time, out of context. So anyway, there's all these things through Matthew. But I want to go, go ahead and to John. So we're going to go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John. And like I said, we're going to spend most of the time in actually John 9 and 10, but I do want to read just a couple scriptures before that out of John 1, 17. And it says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came came through Jesus Christ. I noticed this morning in all the worship songs, they were all about Jesus. It's always interesting how that, that seems to work out. Also, in uh, John 3, this is the one I was talking about earlier. Three, we, we know John 3, 16, but John 3, 14 and 15 is the one about where he says, just as a Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So again, that picture of what happened in Moses' day while they're in the wilderness says the Son of Man is going to be lifted up, and everyone who looks and believes on him. All right, so let's go to chapter 9. And actually, what I wanted to spend most of my time was actually on chapter 10 about the shepherd and his flock. But in order to set up and for you to get the setting of what's going on, you, we kind of need to read through chapter 9 to, to see what's happening here. And so I'm going to read through this, chapter 9, starting with verse 1. And it says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now to his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because many times in the Old Testament, people always acquainted sin with a judgment. You know, like this guy was, was blind because of, of what he had done or what his parents had done. And Jesus answered in verse 3, says, No, neither this man nor his parents sin, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God may be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now having said this, he spit on the ground and he made some mud with saliva and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, and wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So before you start spitting on the ground and making mud and put it on somebody's eyes, just make sure it's the Lord who told you to do that, all right? But that shows how many different ways that the Lord healed people. And what about all things, you know, to spit, to make mud, put it on the guy's eyes, tell him to go wash. This guy was born blind, and he receives the sight. 
So in verse 8 it says, His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begged, asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that it was, and others said, No, he only looks like him. But he wanted, but he himself insisted, I am the man. Well, how then were your eyes open, they demanded. And he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud, and he put it in my eyes, and he told me to go to, to Shalom and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is the man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which, the, on which Jesus had been made the mud and opened the man's eyes was on the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. So some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes, he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. Now the Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? Now we know that this is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can now see, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. We will speak for him. And he will speak for himself. I'm sorry. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that everyone who acknowledged Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Now he replied, he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples do? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are... You are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to, godly, to a godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not God, he could not... If if this man were not from God, he couldn't do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Now Jesus said, you have now seen him, and in fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Now Jesus said, for judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Now some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What are we blind to? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim to see, your guilt remains. So we have this story where this blind man, born blind, is miraculous here. 
by Jesus spitting on the ground, making, making mud, putting on his eyes. And you ever think about this? What if he hadn't gone and got washed? You know, if he hadn't followed through and gone on to the pool of Siloam and actually followed through, he'd say, well, this is ridiculous. Guy put mud on my eyes. But he didn't. He followed through. And he comes back seeing. And then it's interesting how the Pharisees and the Jews, they come questioning him because they don't want to believe this. You know, and, and so he tells them the story. Yes, this man named Jesus was the one who did it. And they still don't believe him, so they call his parents. His parents come. You know, was this, this your son? Was he born blind? Yes. But they didn't want to be kicked out because they knew that anybody who confessed that Jesus was a Christ would be kicked out of the synagogue. And so they put it back on him, and he's pretty bold, you know. He said, well, that's, that's pretty amazing that you guys don't know. And then Jesus finds him later introduces himself so that he actually sees Jesus now with his physical eyes and he worship him. But you see what's, what's setting up here is that there's a confrontation between the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, and Jesus. And so that's what sets the stage for coming up in chapter 10 about the good shepherd because this is really going to, uh, this is really going to upset the Pharisees because they know what he's talking about, and we'll get to, to the Old Testament part of that. But let's go ahead and start in verse 1 of 10. <clears throat> he says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep gate, sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and his sheep listen to him. He calls his own sheep by his name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know him. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Now, Jesus urged Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So he gives this, this little almost parable right there. And, you know, a lot of times we, we talk about this scripture and we talk about sheep, you know. And I don't know if you know a lot of sheep. You know, we used to raise sheep, and they're not the, the you know, sharpest knife in the drawer when it comes to the animal kingdom. But... What he's setting them up for, starting in verse 7, is something they're going to be very, the Pharisees are going to be very, very familiar with. And so, therefore, Jesus said it again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. I lay down, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep follow me. Just as the Father know me, and I have known the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not going, that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So this really is torquing the Pharisees. First of all, he's calling himself the good shepherd. 
and we're going to see why this, this matters in a little while. But he also says, I have other sheep that are not of this flock. In other words, he's talking about the Gentiles. This is not just going to be for the Jewish nation. This is actually going to be for the world. And they didn't like that. Verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This, I, this command I received from my father. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the, the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So he tells them this, and the Pharisees, who earlier he said, you know, you're not blind. In other words, you know the scriptures. Every Jew Many times we would have all the Torah memorized and a lot of the prophets minor and the, and the prophets memorized. So they were very familiar with what Jesus was saying. When he was telling them that he is a good shepherd, when he was telling them that only him and that the rest are hirelings, so he was calling them basically hirelings. That refers back to Ezekiel 34. And I'm going to turn back there and read that passage for you. Ezekiel chapter 34. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> now, when, when Ezekiel's writing this, he was writing it about situations in his day, the leaders in his day. But what Jesus has done... He now takes this and puts it in his day, what's happening in his life. And it says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel, who only take care of themselves. Should not the shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with wool, and slaughter the choicest animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up and the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered, because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered... They became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wander all over the mountains and on every hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched for them or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and so has been plundered and has become food for the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than the flock. Therefore, O shepherd, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for the flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and will no longer, be, no longer be food for them. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his shepherd flock, when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness." I will bring them from the nations and gather them from all the countries where I had. Well, I will bring them into their own land. And you can go ahead and read the rest of that. But the Pharisees knew exactly what he was talking, and that he was talking that word against them. 
And in verse 23, he says, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them, and he will tend them and be their shepherd. Now, obviously, David had been dead for hundreds of years. So he's talking about the son of man, son of David, Jesus. And so Jesus is declaring himself, I am the good shepherd. I am this person. I am the Messiah. And so this really, again, torqued the Pharisees off. And so that's why they wanted to, again, it's kind of like that parable of the talent or the, the tenants, where he says, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to others. And so all through this, through, through Scripture of the Old Testament, we have uh, parallels and, and we have repurposing of Scripture, of, of taking something that we would say if we just read it out of the Old Testament, we'd say, well, that's taking it out of context. And yes, it would be out of context. But the Lord uses it in the New Testament for a new meeting, a more fuller meeting. So anyway, so... The Word is, is, is very important, that we stay in the Word, that we study the Word. But, you know, it's like that old saying, <clears throat> you know, the Word, the Logos, Logos, what we call, you know, the reading Word, without the Spirit, you're going to dry up. The Spirit, without the Word, you'll blow up. In other words, that the Word gives us those, those banks where the river flows. So... Again, what we're going to do now has nothing to do with what I've been talking about. But what we need, I think it was, it was actually Wednesday night. <clears throat> I think Jerry mentioned about the, the, the parable of the ten virgins <clears throat> out of Matthew chapter 25. Well, there's ten virgins. <clears throat> they all have their lamps. They go out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them did not take oil with them. And the oil usually speaks of the Holy Spirit. Five did, and five went in when the bridegroom came. The other five did not. And he says, I, I, don't, I don't know you when they tried to get in later. So it's so important that we get the Holy Spirit, that we have more of him. And, you know, many times you say, well, I was filled with the Holy Spirit back in whatever, you know, 1995 or something. Well, you know, with the disciples, they were filled on the day of Pentecost. But then after that, they were refilled again. So you might say we kind of leak. We need a refilling. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We have to have a breakthrough where we, we will never give up teaching the Word. It's important, and we must be in it. But we've got to have an increase of the presence of the Lord and an increase of the Holy Spirit because that's what changes lives and changes hearts. And so I want us to... I'm going to pray, <clears throat> you know, and, it, <clears throat> and the Word talks about each one having a gift. So everyone in here has been giving some gift, even if you don't realize what that gift is. And want to stir up those gifts within us. We want to ask the Lord for an increase of His, of his Holy Spirit. Because we need to, to begin to break through. We need a breakthrough. A breakthrough, whether it's physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, we need a breakthrough. So I want us to begin to focus. I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to ask you guys to become activated. Everybody's deputized. Everybody's been given the gift. Let's open up and ask the Lord to show you someone who maybe you're supposed to pray for, or maybe you're going to have a word for. You know, we have those nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, we have that gift of prophecy, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, that gift of faith, the working of miracles, gifts of healing, tongues of interpretation. There's so many different gifts the Lord has for us. But we must stir them up at times. We must begin to use them, or else they fall, you know, if you don't lose it, you... You use it, you lose it. So I want to encourage us this morning to begin to, to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what do you have for us today? Somebody might have a prophetic word for all of us.
You might have a prophetic word just for one person. But let's begin to try to get activated, begin to push in, to break in. Because sometimes it's like a, there's a wall in the spirit where you have to kick it down. You have to break through, and it releases so much more. So, Lord, we're just coming right now before you. <clears throat> Lord, just weak vessels. Lord, asking, Lord, for more of you. Asking, Lord, for an increase of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Asking, Lord, to be refilled with your presence. Lord, asking that you would breathe upon us the breath of life, the breath of your Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you would begin to stir up each one here, Lord. Stir up that gift that you have given them, Lord. Stir it up, Lord. Lord, we don't want to lean upon the arm of the flesh, Lord. We look to you. We look to you, Lord. We're longing for more of you. We're crying out, Lord. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, in our weakness, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. Stir up those gifts, Lord. We just say we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We say come, Holy Spirit. Stir us up. Release those gifts, Lord. I ask for a boldness within this people, Lord. Lord, to get their hands out of their pockets and to lay it on someone and see healing come about. Lord, we're desperate for you. We're desperate for more. So we say, Lord, come. Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence. We welcome whatever it is that you want to do. So come. Come.